not having to censor what I think about certain things. That's a fantastic part of being in a community grounded in shared values. Shared values, exactly. Hmm. I think too about when do I know, I feel like church is a uniquely multi-generational place in my life, intentionally multi-generational. Um, I feel like I'm in a community where I can share my values, wonderful ministers ability to share and discuss meaningful topics. Thanks Maureen. Being in covenant together and focusing on a bigger perspective and being present in a different way, being in a community. Susan knows she's at church when she sees our people, our chalice, our interconnection, a place where we are together called into examination of conscience. That's really beautiful, Annie. A place where people are not total strangers, even though you don't know them yet. Isn't that, I think that's a remarkable thing about being in a church community, that there's some understanding of shared values with other people and a shared objective together of kind of exploring meaning and what it means to be human, even though we don't know each other yet, there's some kind of trust there and connection. Well, let's keep these reflections going. You dove deep early on in our service. We'll keep these reflections going in the chat um, as we transition into our opening song offered by Leah Morris, Wake Now Our Senses, and feel free to join us in song. Wake now my senses and hear the earth call Feel the deep power of being in awe Keep with the web of creation your vow Giving, receiving as love shows us how Wake now, compassion, give heed to the cry. Voices of suffering fill the wide sky. Take as your neighbor, both stranger and friend, praying and striving their hardship to As we prepare to light our flaming chalice this morning, we are lucky to hear from a longtime Foothills member, Cheryl Hazlitt, about what it means to her to be a religious person. And it might not be what you're expecting. Cheryl's chalice lighting words are actually taking place within a conversation with Reverend Gretchen. And Gretchen makes a brief appearance at the end. 
And this is a little longer than some of our other chalice lightings, but I also think it's the perfect note on which to begin the service and the series about what it means to be religious. So let's join Cheryl and Gretchen now. Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday evening, and sometimes Saturdays. My dad was a Methodist minister, and it was more important to show up at church than it was to express how you really felt about things. As a little, little person, I loved a lot of parts of the church life because I loved vacation Bible school and the music and the activities and the crafts and all of those things. It was as I got older, I really started to have an internal uncomfortableness. And part of that was when I was a teenager, our youth group was asked to, we had a youth director and we were taken out to places in the community and to go and evangelize, to go witness to people at their front doors. And I did one and I felt so sick inside. I just felt sick inside because I was asking them what I thought were very personal things about who they were. And, you know, I didn't know anything about these people. And I was asking them about the relationship to this God who was supposed to be all knowing, all caring. In the midst of all of this, My mom was sick. She had been diagnosed with cancer when I was 13. She lived for 10 years with with cancer. But for the first five years, it was a secret. We couldn't tell people. I think there's a lot of wounding associated with that. And when she died, I was 22. My father and other church people kept praying for healing. God was going to heal her. And because I had been trained in sciences and biology, and I was like, God's not going to do anything here. Look at her body. I mean, I I don't see that it's going to be like restored to wholeness. And so I think that was, that was where it really just clinched it for me, you know? And then I, I didn't say things. I didn't let people know what I was grappling with. And I had family members who would say, well, don't question your faith. You know, that's a slippery slope. So I kind of hit a point where I was like, well, I'm halfway down the slope. I might as well keep going. I left after my mom's death and moved to Colorado. I was unchurched for 20 years. I didn't want to get pulled into something that I had to pretend that I could buy into. I would try going to church periodically and I would end up just crying. It's like, well, this is not not working. And I think it really clinched for me when, you know, when you're in a service and there are prayers. And I thought, I'm I'm a liar. I'm just a liar because I don't believe what this is anymore. And then after Tom and I had been married, we lost our first child. And I thought I need people because that was a very lonely loss. I actually visited Foothills pretty early in the 90s after we'd lost our daughter. And it wasn't a good experience. So I didn't go for a while. But then after we adopted both kids, I really was still yearning for that community. So I gave myself a deadline. I said, by the beginning of the new year, you need to go to this church and you need to try four times. And 
and the first, it, it was a little, it was bummed, but I will tell you, one of the first people to greet me and befriend me was Rick Gamina. Took me in and greeted me. I was so cordial and so welcoming. Then I met another woman and, and she said, you know, you want to help serve coffee? We could really use it and you can meet people. So that was one of the first ways that I came into Fiddles. And I, of course, sat in pride. And my husband came with me and he sat and held my hand while I cried. But I, I decided it was a place that shared similar values with me. And there were people who had some similar wounds, not all, but I, it was a place I felt like I could start to become more authentic, become more of myself. I was so reluctant to become a member because I had been coerced in every other church. But you know what happened? I think once I made that decision to say, I'm a member, I belong here, these are my people, it really changed my perspective from, um, I'm not someone here to just receive. I'm here to be part of this congregation, this body of people to give, to serve, to be in the community. and and to find my gifts and make use of them. For me, who had always been forced to join a church, but never really knew what that meant or that it was something that should come from the heart, it was, it was been a big deal. It's been a big deal. I'm religious, but not in the way you want to think I am. I've had somebody say, well, do you believe in God? And I'd say, well, my God is not in any kind of box. My religion is not in this defined box. It's bigger, it's, it's, it's just huge. And it's ever growing and ever encompassing because there's so much in this world and with each other we don't know about. So am I religious in that I look for strength from my faith and my beliefs? Yes, I'm religious in that respect. Am I religious in terms of do I follow a dogma or a certain belief structure? Not, not the way most churches do. Going through Wellspring, and I've done the three different types of courses, the sources where you learn about being Unitarian, Universalism, Wellspring 2, which is a deeper dive, and then this last year, Braiding Sweetgrass. But I, I think one of the most valuable things for me was learning to sit quietly and calmly and listen to others' perspectives and stories and tell my own and <clears throat> to, to practice just being with people and not having to do, perform, show, just being together. I brought that home into my own life that I don't always have to do, perform, sometimes it's, it's good to be, to just sit, to, to be more calm and quiet. Early in our lives, we're caught up in how much we can achieve, how fast we can get things accomplished, how good our family looks, if we're saved or not. <laughs> and at this point in time, I'm kind of in a different place where it's like, you know, let it go. Just let it go because who you are and what you bring to the world is, is more important than all the trappings. I think I, I'm a lot more accepting and forgiving of others. And, you know, it's, it's also made me look at, I can be really, I've had, always had really high expectations for myself. So I put those on my family and my family is, it's like, they're not who I want them to be. They are who they are. And so I think I'm at this place now. It's like, how, how do I appreciate and, and revel in that rather than my vision of what I thought they should be? What you've just said is one of my, my hopes for how, what religion can do for us, to let us love the world we have and to, to learn how to love the life we have, which is you know, a lifelong journey. But I think that's what we're most called to do is, is to learn how to love 
life as it is and to hold the tensions and the grief and the pain and the loss and to meet it with love. So it's beautiful to hear you describe it like that. I, I love what you just said because it, I mean, what else is there? What else is there? So with this, we light our chalice for a religion that helps us to love more of the world in every way we can. Please join me in the words of our covenant, which begins with the words love. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. Cheryl, thank you so much for sharing your heart with us this morning. That was so beautiful. And as we, one way that we practice our covenant together, the covenant that we just spoke aloud, is by sharing with each other the challenges and the celebrations of our lives so that we can better companion each other and bear witness to this thread of life that connects us all in a tangled blessing of both sorrow and abundant blessings. As I share the joys and sorrows of the congregation into this space in a few moments, I invite you to type into the chat whatever it is that's on your heart this morning that you'd like to share with this community so that we may hold it in our loving embrace. Let's take some time now and find ourselves fully here, bring ourselves more fully present and to take a moment to look inward. So I invite you to take a slow, deep breath in. To feel your body in the chair or feel your body, however it is situated or held right now. If you're seated or standing to feel your feet on the earth, and if it might feel comfortable, perhaps you wish to close your eyes or to soften your gaze. And maybe you wish to place one hand over your heart while the other is placed on your knee with an openness. And let's breathe together here for a few breaths. And bring your attention to the beating of your heart. See if you can even feel it on your hand or hear it in your chest. And with your open hand, imagine receiving the pulse, receiving the heartbeat of every other person in this virtual sanctuary. In the rhythms of our hearts, we are both entirely particular, our own people, and we are also deeply interconnected. Stay with this sensation as we invite into our hearts the prayers of our community. Many in our congregation have been sick with COVID in the last few weeks. We are grateful for the vaccines that have made most of these cases mild, and still the illness is difficult and it can mean loss of work, struggle in the family, missed vacations and other losses. We hold all of these people with care. May all those who are feeling ill feel surrounded by love and by the presence of this greater community. We also hold in our hearts the life of Edith Held, longtime Foothills member who died this week at the age of 99. Her memorial will be held on September 15th. We give thanks for Edith's life and we hold their whole family in our hearts this morning. 
looking to the chat this morning. There is joy about coming back to the Foothills community. And our hearts are with uh, our community member today who's sharing in the great loss and sending loving comfort to the many people who are affected. So for these joys and sorrows and all those held in the silent sanctuaries of our hearts, we honor these joys and sorrows and may they be held in love and in the care of this community. Beyond these prayers named aloud, may we all feel the compassion embodied here in this space for all those places that need forgiveness, may forgiveness be given and received. For the grief we carry, may we find healing and hope. For the division in our nation, in our families, in our lives, for violence of all kinds, for fear that keeps us isolated and reactive, for the ways we fail each other and ourselves, may we all be restored to a new wholeness and trust held by a unifying ultimate love. And for the many blessings of our lives, the beauty we create and receive in the everyday, may our hearts be overcome with gratitude. Let us join together in a time of song and musical meditation with this piece over my head. Over my head, I hear music in the air. Over my head, I hear music in the air. Over my head. in the air There must be a God somewhere Over my Our reading this morning is by Scott Alexander. It's entitled, Getting Serious About Unitarian Universalism. At one point in her novel, Fly Away Home, American writer Marge Piercy has a mother say to her daughters, the girls had been raised Unitarian Universalists. 
which seemed a nice sensible compromise between having no religion at all and having to lie about what we believed. Enough religion to be respectable, but not enough to get in the way. Ouch, that hurts. It hurts if, like me, you're proud to be a Unitarian Universalist and strive to be serious about your own religious life. But whether we like it or not, this is precisely what many people from other faith groups think of UUs. Remember the old jokes? Question, what is Unitarian Universalism? Answer, a way station between Methodism and the golf course. Question, what do you get when you cross a Jehovah's Witness with a Unitarian Universalist? Answer, someone knocks at your door for no particular reason. I used to laugh when someone told jokes about how laid back and lax we Unitarian Universalists are about our religion, but I'm not laughing anymore. I've stopped laughing because I realize how terribly important it is for me to take my religious life seriously. I've stopped laughing because I believe with all my heart and soul that this troubled world desperately needs the compassionate and saving vision of Unitarian Universalism. I believe people, millions of people of many different cultures and backgrounds need this transforming faith. We can no longer allow ourselves to be marginalized, ridiculed, or dismissed. Unitarian Universalism will never realize its great potential and mission unless we take ourselves seriously as religious people. was 2007 when I could keep it in no longer. I had avoided the issue long enough. I downplayed my feelings, guarded my intuition. I'd kept, kept a lot of my favorite things, even my friendships on the down low. But I couldn't hide it anymore from myself or from the world. One Sunday late that year, a few months after I started seminary, I preached a sermon and officially came out as religious. I called the sermon the Scarlet R. In some ways, coming out as religious was more difficult for me than coming out as queer. In the circles I run in, being religious carries more baggage and causes more confusion than any term about sexuality might. So much so that I could be finishing my first semester in seminary and still not be convinced that I was a religious person. I was like, I mean, I guess I might be religious since I'm in seminary. Kind of like I might be religious if I gather with Others on Sunday morning kindle a flame, sing hymns, sit in silence and in gratitude I might be or you might be. Now you'll notice when I described my hesitancy to come out as religious, I told you how I assumed other people would react. But like with sexuality, what I've realized about religious identity is that the real demon to confront is in here. I mean, it's mostly about you, me, our own fears and prejudices, your own sense about what sort of person you are, your limitations of imagination, I mean, your own stereotypes. I'm not one of those kind of people, you might say. Or I might say, I mean, I remember the first time that I, rem I read the Bible in public, I was like, <laughs> I mean, it was like I was reading 
pornography or something, except I think I was even more embarrassed to be reading the Bible. Despite what the Supreme Court might have you believe, more and more people in the last few decades have come to share my reluctance to claim a religious identity. Anecdotally, what I see at Foothills in our newcomers is that we have two main sorts of people starting to show up in, in the last few years. The first are those who were raised in religions that they ended up leaving, like Cheryl's story. They're, these are mostly people who are Gen X, uh, boomers, silent generation, as in over 40 or so, not all of them, but mostly. Um, many in this group do carry wounds from those experiences as Cheryl described, and others, some, arrive having been a member at another Unitarian Universalist congregation where they've done some work to claim a new religious identity. And then, so that's the first group, and then you've got the second group. These are people who've had zero prior experience in a religious community. They tend to be younger, like under 40, millennials, Gen Z, but again, not exclusively. There's some who are older who also have zero religious uh, community experience. They also tend to have a generally negative experience about a certain sort of Christianity or church people generally, but they're more neutral about any particular religious practice or word or concept. Mostly because these practices and ideas and words, they're not attached for them to any meaning or context. It's more like the, they're experiencing more like what you experience when you have to uh, learn about a new culture or a new language in that it's not really good or bad. It's just, it's just neutral. It's just new. There is, of course, a small yet mighty minority of folks who arrive here having been raised Unitarian Universalists, either here, as in returning as adults to Foothills, or they were raised UU in another congregation. This group most often aligns with the second category, those who had no religious experience, except for they also come with an added layer of confusion or irritation with those of us who show up in their religious home and then spend our time debating whether or not it is actually a religion. I mean, have you seen lately the mural in the basement of Foothills Religious Education Building? Uh, I mean, if you haven't, I just encourage you to try to check it out sometime because we send our children there and sometimes our adults for um, small groups, but we send them there and as they, they walk down the hallway, they will encounter people, many people who risked their whole lives for the sake of their religious faith, including at the far end, beginning, end, whichever way you walk, you find Unitarian Michael Servetus, who was burned at the stake in the 16th century. It's literally a portrayal of him being burned at the stake because he didn't believe in the Trinity. Meanwhile, they hear most of their church being all, but we're not really a religion, right? You can see how they might be confused slash irritated. Anyway, my anecdotal trends tend to match with what the most recent studies are showing from the Pew Research Center, which just last year described that three out of 10, almost 30% of Americans now identify as having no religious affiliation at all. With 40%, four out of 10, millennials identifying as not having any religious affiliation. That's a 13% increase in the last 10 years. There are all sorts of reasons why people have left institutional religion. When people are asked, they, they tend to talk about a few different things, including the most obvious one, that they've had a change in beliefs. That is that slippery slope that Cheryl was warned about. Or they might also talk about not agreeing with the church's stance on LGBTQ people or their, how the church treats women. But just as often people will talk about a disillusionment with the idea of organized religion itself, whether due to abuse and cover-ups revealed in the last few decades, 
or a more generic sense of corruption people feel uh, exists in the institutional church. Many people have lost faith in the idea of church. This skepticism about religion shows up in almost every new arrival who shows up in our community, even those with no church background at all. And sometimes the skepticism hangs on in a person for years after someone has been coming regularly, participating fully, even when they feel like they seem to me so clearly in. Cheryl shared a little about her reluctance to becoming an official member, how long it took her to decide to sign the book, become an, say that she belonged. But what she didn't and most of you all don't realize when you are in that state is that this is a community filled with people who, are, who feel a very similar tension. A whole church filled with people who aren't sure that they are church people. When the song Losing My Religion came out my sophomore year in high school, my best friend Heather and I used to listen to it on repeat on my little pink cassette player. It was a, like a mini boom box. We loved the tortured mandolin sounds and the very cool lead singer, Michael Stipe. And we happily obliged MTV's constant replaying of his video basically once every hour, four months. <laughs> Most of all, we were very proud to tell anyone who would listen that we knew the true meaning of the song's title, which was not actually about religion, did you know? Losing my religion is a Southern phrase. That means being at the end of your rope, as in being totally lost, disoriented and disenchanted, so lost that you would lose, lose your religion, lose your faith in God. Now the experience of literally losing your religion is quite like this, actually. It happens for most people gradually and then suddenly. Even if the experience is ultimately liberating and life-saving, it is almost always also painful as it involves the loss of a community, identity, anchoring rituals and practices, which also means it often includes grief and anger. Sometimes it also includes losing your family and your closest friends, your sense of yourself. People come to Unitarian Universalist congregations, both hoping to heal from this kind of loss and also clinging to it as a kind of stand-in for the identity their religion used to give them. Which is how it can happen that people can continue to identify as non-religious, even while also regularly attending church or serving in a church, singing in the choir, sending their kids to religious education programs, and participating in small groups. Continuing to understand yourself as non-religious, as not a church person, provides an incredible armor, a protective device, if you will, because to let go of your non-religious identity is to risk being rejected and lost in all the same ways all over again. It's just that not letting go of your non-religious identity is also a way to make sure that that healing that you come seeking never fully happens. Or that the gift is never fully received. In his book, Atomic Habits, James Clear talks about the ways that at our deepest levels, our habits are connected to our sense of our identity. He gives an example of smoking, of trying to quit smoking. How often he says that someone who is trying to stop smoking will say, I'm trying to quit, which seems obvious and reasonable. But behind that statement, he says, is often still a self-understanding that I'm a smoker who's trying to quit. He suggests that instead of saying, I'm trying to quit, a person should say to themselves, I'm not a smoker, I'm a non-smoker. So that the work is to change your identity, your self-understanding, which in turn helps shape your habits. 
but I've wondered how it works in reverse. As in, if you never really change your identity, but you do take up those new habits, will those habits affect you at a deeper level? I mean, is there a point where no matter how often you show up at church or participate in the practices of church, if we aren't willing to let these practices correspond with a deeper shift in how we understand ourselves, then it seems likely that we are holding the community and its, its real possibility for impact and change at arm's length. This possibility, this reality, came crashing down on me as I was finishing up my first year in seminary when I was serving as a chaplain intern at the Denver Women's uh, Prison. Now, some of you have heard me tell this story before, but it's a good one, so it bears repeating. Now, how church happened at the women's prison is that every Friday night, we would gather for worship which I quickly learned meant gathering around a CD player that was blasting what some call Jesus is my boyfriend music. Maybe you're familiar with it. So this music would fill the room and the women would sing along and with all their hearts, they would, they would raise, let's see if I can do it. They would raise their arms and they would just sing along, closing their eyes and they would say, sing Jesus, Jesus, at least this was my initial impression. And I, on the other hand, would be standing in the back with my arms firmly crossed, hoping to communicate to anyone who looked my way that this was not my thing. After all, I was, I was not religious. More than feeling just like personally uncomfortable, I was also feeling kind of embarrassed for the women and all this like cheesy superficial theology that they had somehow been tricked into embracing. And from this distanced and defended place, I just watched. My stance in the back of the room was like my own little force field that had me thinking a lot about systems of oppression, economic injustice, generational poverty, et cetera, et cetera, and therefore protected my body, my heart, my mind from any deeper personalized engagement with the life that was in the room. But then between each worship service, the women would come, they would, they would make appointments with me or I would just see them in the hall or in the, when they would come to the chaplain's office and they would talk with me. And I started to get to know them. Arms unfolded. I heard their stories of greater loss than I could even fathom. More struggle than you'd think one person could manage to endure. And then Friday night would come again and they'd sing and they'd cry and then they'd laugh together and they'd release from their bodies just a little bit of the stories that I knew lived there. So one Friday night I was standing there and this, I was like in my posture and this song came on. It was, change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. Make it be like you. And suddenly, right then, it just, it just hit me. I mean, it hit me. Who should really be embarrassed in that room? And in case it's not clear, it was not the women singing and swaying. In that moment, it, it hit me that the words, the words of the song, it didn't matter. The theology, like the Jesus as my boyfriend, humanized father, God centered as it was, none of it really even mattered because the room was filled with life. The room was filled with life and there was just one person in that room who was refusing to engage with that life embodied there in this fellowship of women singing about the possibility of healing and goodness and forgiveness and transformation. And so I started singing, change my heart, oh God. I stepped in like a little bit closer. 
And I started singing louder, make it ever true. Okay, yes, I was still obviously totally uncomfortable, but I was kind of leaning into my discomfort, learning from it, letting it, like Cheryl said, I was letting it just, just be. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, make it be like you. Actually, it wasn't just uncomfortable, it was also terrifying. To let down my defenses like that, to invite these words into my mouth without clarifying what I did or did not actually believe, to sing with full voice about Jesus and how I, I believe in him, his love for me, how it saves me. It was terrifying to give in to the experience knowing that I too had experienced pain and shame beyond what I was willing to name or claim. It was terrifying just just to be present in the midst of all of that discomfort in the midst of all of that love it was terrifying and it was transforming after that night I could receive more people more fully I could be with more people more fully and I could love the world more fully, receive love more fully. This is, as Cheryl said, my understanding as what, of what is possible when, when religion is at its best. When Unitarian Universalist Church is doing what we are called to do and when, and when we are being who we are called to be. That is when we let down that protective armor and let life simply be, to receive it all, arms unfolded, and to meet everything with love. In a world where church people, religious people, have done so much damage, are doing so much damage, and bring so much death it makes sense why we would all continue to be skeptical of proudly wearing the scarlet R. Our, ca our caution is warranted, maybe even ethical. But it is that same world that needs Unitarian Universalists who understand ourselves and what we are up to in our congregation with a deeper seriousness and a greater commitment, a religious commitment that orients us at our deepest and most unshakable levels. Our world needs us to let down our armor and declare ourselves proudly and clearly church people showing up religiously with an open heart and an open mind, ready to partner with the work of courageous love, wherever and however it calls us ever on. Change my heart, oh love, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh love, make it be like you. Amen. It was 2007 when I could... So one of my favorite religious practices in our community is the way we remember how our lives are filled with gifts. And so we respond to life with an orientation of gratitude and generosity. And we practice this each week by sharing half our offering plate 
with an effort in our community that furthers our values. And this month, we are so grateful to be sharing our offering with Sanctuary Everywhere, a ministry we oversee here at Foothills, and yet a ministry that is open to and inclusive of many volunteers and leaders beyond our community. We started Sanctuary Everywhere in 2019 when it became clear that in-church sanctuary was no longer a viable option. And so instead we formed villages around asylum seekers who remained in the community. Since then, we have formed five villages and companioned five families of a great variety of sizes and circumstances. Throughout this work, we have partnered with the immigrant-led community organizations in Foothills, especially, uh, sorry, in Fort Collins, especially La Cocina, which has provided ongoing supervision and feedback. So this personal, impactful, and life-changing ministry requires ongoing financial support, especially to help immigrants retain sufficient housing, education, and community resources, as well as to cover the substantial legal fees and administrative costs of the immigration process. So everything you give today through texting 84321, just text the amount plus the word share, or by giving at foothillsuu.org slash share the plate, will be shared equally to support Sanctuary Everywhere and to also support our mission of unleashing courageous love in Northern Colorado and beyond. We will now gratefully receive your generous offering. As we move to the end of our service, we turn now to the time we set aside each week to intentionally pay attention to the gifts of life and to feel grateful. So let's take a few moments and bring to mind and bring into our heart all of the goodness and insight that we've shared this morning, whatever it was in this service that touched your heart, that made you remember who you wish to be in this world, wherever you felt, uh, a, the breeze of inspiration and bring your mind to where beauty and goodness are living in your life. It might be just in a few specific places or it might be overflowing in your life. You might have an abundant garden of things to be grateful for. It might be something mundane and every day, or it might be something very special in particular to this moment. And whatever those things are that we are grateful for, let us welcome them into our hearts. Let those gratitudes fill us up. And as you are ready, I invite you to type them into the chat, share with us what you are grateful for, because we know that gratitude is contagious. And when we encounter the gratitudes of others, it helps us see even more fully the abundance and goodness in our own lives. Let's see what people are sharing in the chat this morning. Gratitude to have found this faith community where it is an intergenerational group teaching and learning and working to bring more love into the world. Gratitude for last night's beautiful sunset, for family, for having a mom in town to celebrate our kiddos' first birthday, congratulations. Gratitude for hammocks and shade and breezes, for power and internet. Yeah, our power went out last night. Gratitude for the opportunity to be with us from Indiana. Welcome, Ginny. Gratitude for another church services that left salt spots on my glasses. Gratitude for love, life, and faith for Tanner and all his skills that's coming from Jen Powell, who let's give Jen a round of applause for making it through this service and all the tech complexities and gratitude for the words spoken today by our ministers and gratitude for close friends. 
So for these and so much more, we are grateful today. In this spirit of gratitude, let us join together in our closing song, We Shall Be Known. We shall be known by the company we keep, by the ones who circle round to tend these fires. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within the earth. It is time now. It is time now that we thrive. It is time we lead ourselves into the well. It is time now, and what a time to be alive in this great turning we shall learn to lead in the We shall be known by the company we keep, by the ones who circle round to tend these fires. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within. Whatever we encounter today, may we meet it with open arms and an open heart. Go and love the world in all its beauty, brokenness, and possibility with all of your heart. Our worship time has ended. Our service just begins. Go in peace and in love. Amen. <laughs>